We are extremely fortunate to have with us uh, Dr. Elizabeth Cochran, who is a geologist at the USGS, United States Geological Survey, located on the Caltech campus. Elizabeth is from California. She said to me earlier she keeps trying to get away, but you know she studies earthquakes and then she's so she's <laughs> here in California. Uh, did all her education through the UC system, um, included UCLA and a postdoc at San Diego, and I think undergraduate at Santa Barbara. Uh, was a professor at Riverside and now is at U, uh, USGS. And she uh, in 2011 won the Young uh oh Young Investigator Early Career. Scientist engineer. <laughs> <laughs> what was the name of it again? I wrote it and then I forgot my sticker. Uh, Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers. So, so <laughs> given to her by Barack Obama, our president. So, yes. So, so this fine young woman knows her stuff and is going to tell us about how what we can do to uh, deal with the fact that we live on a planet with lots of cracks in its crust that is rocking and rolling and shaking all the time. This is a picture from 3 o'clock this afternoon. This is, if you go on to the USGS site and look at the earthquakes uh, map, they're constant. The, the crust is constantly moving. So of course sometimes that has spooky ramifications and we want to get prepared to deal with it. So tonight Elizabeth is going to be talking about the early warning system. How many of you have seen something in the news about an early warning system in California? How many of you have been wondering about it and how do I get hooked in, right? Uh, so, uh, so Dr. Cochran, please tell us what in the world, and maybe you want to do your own sure. signal, it's the arrow to the right, that okay. one, uh, is the early warning system and how does it work? Sure. Well, first of all, um, it is not earthquake prediction. So that's the, the typical question that I get is that, oh, so you've now, you now know how to predict earthquakes and you'll give us a warning ahead of time. No, we have not figured out how to predict earthquakes. We're still working on that. For an earthquake early warning system, we're simply taking advantage of several key aspects of an earthquake. Um, the first of which is that there's different seismic waves that come out of any earthquake. There's what are called P waves and S waves. P waves are the first waves. They tend to be very, very small. Um, and so they're, they're almost a warning in and of itself. If you feel a little bit of shaking, it's the P wave coming in. And then later, a few seconds, tens of seconds, depending on how far away the earthquake is, you get the S waves, which are the secondary waves. These tend to be the ones that are more damaging. They tend to be the ones that you feel kind of shearing you side to side. Um, and so the nice thing is the more jam damaging waves travel more slowly. So we actually um, see on here the yellow line indicates the P wave um, at various locations away from an earthquake. And the red line is the S wave. So you can see there's a nice separation. It gets longer depending on how far away you are from the earthquake. The distance in miles? Probably in kilometers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, it's not labeled. Um, so again, we're really taking advantage of the fact that an earthquake has started somewhere, and we can rapidly detect that. So in this case, I'm showing you a simulation of a magnitude 7.8 on the southern San Andreas, starting near the, the Salton Sea. And you'll see the little red and yellow blob. That's where the earthquake is starting. It takes a little while for an earthquake to travel out away from where it starts, particularly if it's a long, earth, or a long rupture. Uh, the little number in the lower left is the time after the earthquake started. So this is five seconds after the earthquake started. The Earthquake has now been detected by a couple of stations. And that's really what we're using to figure out, OK, there's an earthquake going on. The waves travel from the earthquake, which starts at depth, up to the surface. And then we have stations scattered around. Those are those triangles. And if you're right on top of where the earthquake starts, you're really not going to get any warning, because we have to actually sense the earthquake with our stations before we can send a warning out. But once we do, we can send warning out to places farther away. So in this case, it takes maybe five seconds to detect the earthquake. Then we can send that warning out to all of the populated areas. And the rupture continues moving up the fault. 
So strong shaking will arrive in Palm Springs in this particular event about 25 seconds after the earthquake starts, which means we could potentially give Palm Springs about 20 seconds of warning. S similarly, it takes longer to get San Bernardino, Orange County, and here in Los Angeles, it'll take about uh, 1 minute and 30 seconds for that shaking to arrive. So gives us a great. potentially <laughs> decent amount of, yeah. of time. <laughs> um, the other thing we're actually getting more into sort of the science, the other thing we, we um, need to be able to do is, if you notice here, the rupture actually takes a long time to travel up that fault. So it can take tens of seconds to travel the 180 kilometers along that fault. And a big question is, how do we know when an earthquake starts, how big it's going to be? And so we can actually use um, the information in the, in the actual wiggles of our seismograms. So as seismologists, we love mm. looking at seismograms and looking at these little wiggles. Everyone thinks we're crazy. <laughs> but <laughs> the reason is they actually tell us something about the earthquake. And in this case, um, for small earthquakes, the, the wiggles tend to be high frequency, so you get lots of uh, up and down motion close together. The larger earthquakes tend to have very long period motion, even right at the start. So there's something fundamentally different about mm. how these earthquakes start and probably why they continue to rupture down the fault. And so we can use just a small snapshot, about three seconds or even less, be able to tell you it's going to be a 2, a 4, a 6, or an 8 earthquake very, very quickly. Oh, that's so great. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I'm, I, I, don't, I only moved here eight years ago, so this oh. like freaks me out every time the earth moves. <laughs> but anyway, go ahead. I'm just like, yay! Um, so you may, I mean, I showed a, a great example from an event that starts on the San Andreas. You know, San Andreas is, is the, everyone thinks it's the only fault in California, but here, um, what are highlighted in the colors are all of the main faults we have in Southern California. These aren't even all of the faults. These are just the main ones. Um, and uh, so there's a lot of faults actually right underneath Los Angeles um, and throughout the LA basin, as well as extending down towards the Salton Sea and then obviously as you go up north. So in here, Essentially what we did was try to figure out, well, what earthquakes do we actually want a warning for? So when is shaking going to be really strong here in Los Angeles? So the colors just tell you how strong the shaking is. Red is very strong. Uh, blue is something you won't really feel. And so you can see there are a lot of potential earthquake starting points where we would get very strong shaking here in Los Angeles and we could actually use an early warning system for. May I interrupt just for sure. a second? Uh, how many of you, uh, when you feel an earthquake, go immediately to the USGS site? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. see there, you, isn't that great? Yeah. How many of you do the did you feel it? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So for those of you who may not be aware, there, if you go to the United States, it's just usgs.gov, I believe, mm -hmm. and uh, you can quickly direct yourself to the earthquake that just happened, and then there's a little button, did you feel it, D-Y-F-I, and you click on it and then it asks you for your data. What's your address or the closest thing you want, you know, did, you, did your pictures move, did anything fall off the shelves, you know, did, did, was you, were you scared, were you asleep, did it wake you up? It, it's kind of interesting the questions they ask. And then they compile those mm -hmm. data from everybody who voluntarily adds it to make these maps, not those precise maps, but kind of color coded the same to say how, where was the, what was the shake zone. So I wanted to interrupt long enough yeah. just to say, do it. Yes. Be part of the mm -hmm. g data providing and data gathering because it's really it's fun also mm -hmm. to do, and then you know you're you're contributing. Um, so I'd like to encourage you to do that. Yeah, and uh, if you're a seismologist or someone who likes messing with the system, you go on and, and say you did not feel it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you hear about an earthquake nearby and you didn't feel it. That's actually also. Oh, okay. I thought you meant. Not deliberately it. putting no. in bad no, information. No, no, no. Don't do that. No. <laughs> so if you did not feel it, you can say you did not feel okay. it. And that still tells us something. Um, 
Earthquake in LA. I was in Chicago. I did not feel right. it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. that point. Exactly. You know, the one. <laughs> 2,000 <laughs> kilometers away. <laughs> Boundary conditions are important. Right. <laughs> so um, the other question we often get is, what am I going to do with a couple of seconds of warning? Because I, I showed you the kind of a best case scenario where an earthquake starts on the southern San Andreas, very far away from Los Angeles. What if it starts close to, you know, where we are here? And so a lot of people say, well, what am I going to do with two seconds of warning? And, you know, there are a lot of things you can do in terms of what you yourself can do. So personal safety. I know. <laughs> uh. Imagine <laughs> you are going in for LASIK surgery. Maybe two seconds would be enough time to, for that doctor to shut that laser off. That would be good. Um, but I'm with you. Sorry. I know. We'll let you know when that picture is gone for those right. of you who have your eyes closed. <laughs> <laughs> so, and otherwise, um, you would take the same sort of protective action that you're supposed to take. Everyone know what you're supposed to do in an earthquake? Close your eyes. Yay. Run to the depths of space and watch the skies go around. Close your eyes. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, duck cover and hold on. <laughs> um, but there are also a lot of automated controls that can happen. For example, slowing and stopping trains, um, automatically telling planes not to land at LAX or any of the, our other local airports. And then, of course, this is very useful for emergency management giving fire stations a couple of seconds to open their doors and make sure they're all ready to go um, once the shaking stops. Okay, it's yeah. gone. It's gone. Yeah. <laughs> it's all safe. Um, so are we the first place to ever come up with this crazy idea of earthquake early warning? No, um, we're kind of almost late to the game. Um, so there are early warning systems in development all over the world. Uh, I don't know, have any of you heard of the um, earthquake early warning system in Japan? Yeah. yeah. So that's been in operation um, since about 2008 or 9, I always forget. Um, and so that's been sending warning out for earthquakes. It sent a uh, warning out uh, at the time of the uh, magnitude 9 Tohoku earthquake. Slightly uh, underestimated the magnitude. It said it was magnitude 8 instead of a 9. Um, and that goes into kind of what needs to be done in the future to make sure we get those uh, numbers exactly right. Uh, there's also an early warning system in Mexico. Um, it's actually primarily for Mexico City. Um, but so when an earthquake happens off of the coast of the west coast of Mexico, a warning is sent to Mexico City itself. Mexico City is on, located on a very deep basin. And so even for earthquakes that occur very far away from Mexico City, they tend to have very large shaking. And so the 1985 um, earthquake was an example of that. So, so what's next? So we've got this. Uh, you, you showed a hypothetical and the, right. the theory behind it. So mm -hmm. where are we on the system for California and where are we headed? And why was it in the news this month? OK. <laughs> Good lead in. <laughs> um, so we've been working on this system actually now for, um, for about four years, um, even prior to when I was in the USGS. Uh, and we have been sending out alerts to a select set of users for about two years now. And so our system is, we're currently calling it a, a demonstration system. So this is essentially, we're standing up all of the software we need to do this. We're trying to build lots of stations. What's shown on this map are distribution of the seismic stations across the state of California. Some of those, um, most of these are contributing to the earthquake early warning, warnings that go out. However, we need more stations. We need to upgrade those stations. But essentially what we have is we have these stations running. We're detecting earthquakes very quickly. We're se we've been sending alerts since um, for about two years, as I said. And these alerts are being received by certain people on essentially a desktop program. I do also have a, a phone app, which um, 
gives me alerts. And I actually went off in the car while I was driving here because there was... <laughs> Because there was a magnitude four um, earthquake in Central California. Wow! So, so I had it going off, and but it's all right. It goes off right now. It goes off for magnitude two and a half to threes yeah. even, and that's mostly because we're testing it. Um, so, in this past year, we've had a couple of great examples of how the system has performed. Um, how many of you felt the La Habra earthquake? In March, I just don't remember. Yeah. It Do by you guys name. remember it? Well, this was the one that <laughs> was near La Habra. <laughs> um, March so, 28th. March twenty eighth. Yeah, uh, it was about nine p.m. and so a warning was sent out through the early warning system about four seconds after the earthquake started. Um, so that's fairly fast after the earthquake started. Uh, we also had what you were refer referring to was the South Napa earthquake, the magnitude 6, in August. Um, and this sent or out the first alert about The one that broke seconds. all those wine bottles. Right, the one, <laughs> the <laughs> one that ruined the wine I for know. years to come. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> like, will you still get a, like, if you turn your phone off at night? No. No. No, so, so the question was, if you have your phone off, will you get the alert? No, it doesn't. I think it would take too long for my phone in particular to turn on. <laughs> but if you have your phone muted, it's still, you still hear the yeah. alert come through. Off -off. Oh, like, okay. Yeah, no, so if you have it muted, you still get the I'm alert. I'm just curious if you got yeah. a text message or something. No, it's actually a, a, a pro, a, an app that starts up and starts talking to you and says, earthquake. No shake. Well, mine said for the event that happened on my way here, no shaking expected in 65 seconds. <laughs> Very useful. <laughs> <laughs> so but the, again, the idea is right now we're testing the system. So I actually have set that so I hear everything. Do you do tsunami warnings? Uh, tsunami warnings are actually handled by NOAA. It's a different organization. Um, but what this would enable is faster tsunami warnings as well. Oh, yeah. Is the phone app available to the public at this point? Not at this point, no. So the early warning um, project at this point is not uh, sending out public alerts. And I can go into a little bit of as to why that is, maybe. I think you are, are we're headed there. Okay, yeah, so I'm headed we, there. Let me just, yeah. so this, the time it takes us to actually get an alert is just <coughs> the time it takes for the, the waves to reach at least four stations, and how long it takes those stations to actually report back to our um, centralized servers. So what are we doing next? Uh, building out stations. Um, this is a comparison of the stations in Japan, the station spacing, compared to California. So this is one of the reasons we do not have a public early warning system, is we do not have the necessary stations. How big are the stations? Um, it varies. So some stations, a lot of the stations, we actually um, dig into the ground, sort of six to eight feet deep in these fairly large vault, what do we call vaults. And so we install a couple of different types of sensors, and they, plus they have solar panels, they tend to be in fairly remote places. There are other stations that are kind of this size um, that are in, can be installed in um, fire stations and that. So this is showing um, one of the things that I mentioned is there are some limitations to, for example, the Japanese system where it didn't fully, fully recognize that the earthquake was a magnitude 9 rather than a magnitude 8, as was reported. And one of the reasons that that is is because a lot of these systems essentially assume that earthquakes are a point source. It's very easy to say, okay, this is where the earthquake started and it's so big. Um, but that kind of breaks down when you have a rupture that, that goes for many, many miles, as is shown here. Um, in addition, the shaking that's expected varies, is going to vary if you assume your earthquake is just down in the Salton Sea, 
many, you know, 150 miles away from Los Angeles versus a rupture that actually propagates up towards Los Angeles and gets closer to Los Angeles. So <coughs> shaking levels expected are going to be much higher if the rupture is propagating towards you. So we're working on kind of how to, how to recognize that. Do you think that there will ever be like a more efficient way of getting these alerts? I understand uh, maybe you said something about iPhone alerts, but what about like maybe they're like little home stations or something more mm -hmm. on a personal level than having to hear back from some big station, maybe, I don't know, 100 miles away from my own house, you know? Yeah, so we, um, so we are working with uh, several private companies who are going to be working on kind of the distribution of the alerts. And so alerts will go out every way they can. They'll go out radio, TV, cell phones. They'll probably be little devices you have installed in your houses. Um, so that's, that's really the next piece of this. And, and may I just elaborate a little bit because I want to clarify that the idea of having it be detected by a station that's hundreds of miles away is actually working to your benefit. Right. Because if it detects it down here close to where it starts, <laughs> The signal it sends through the internets, the intertubes, is faster than, right. the, than the signal propagates through the earth. Mm -hmm. So, so it, it's like it, the hare jumping out ahead of the tortoise and telling you the tortoise is on the way. So you actually want the, that, but, but the, I just wanted to clarify for right. people listening that, that that's, those are two different things, the stations that detect it, and then the means by which you get the alert. Um, two questions there and there. Um, my first question is, I notice that your propagation of the wave is different if you're a P wave or an S wave. What causes the P wave and, and how do you differentiate between a P wave and an S wave? What causes a P wave and what causes an S wave? Okay, so both waves are generated at the time of the earthquake rupture. And so a P wave is a compressional wave, m much like a sound wave. An S wave is a shear wave and they're just both waves that are generated by the motion of the fault. And so they just propagate through the rocks at different speeds. And then there was a question, I think, this young one. So I was curious, because you mentioned the internet, and I was curious if that, the net neutrality, like, if oh, it was, um, affects having a public warning system like that. Uh, we haven't really considered that. Yeah. <laughs> That potentially. is a very interesting question. I'll step out on a limb and right. say, yeah, potentially this is yeah. something we should worry about. Yeah. If, you're, if your web providers are throttling signals from people that they don't want you to get that information quickly, let's hope USGS.gov isn't one of them. <laughs> right. <laughs> OK. Uh, oh, yes. I just, um, if you have a much longer warning, uh, do you anticipate that the training around what to do in an earthquake would change? Because as they say, like, Earthquakes don't kill people, buildings kill people, so if I had a minute to leave my apartment, you know, I would want to be in a grassy field as opposed to... But can you get to a grassy field in a minute? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but, but would, because no, depending because, on where you live, right. if you have space in the backyard Should to get somewhere, a park across the street, and you can do it in 20 seconds, yeah. and you know you've got 40 seconds... Maybe that install really, that zip line. Right. <laughs> Yeah, that's one of the things we're looking at as to whether we tell people to do different things. In general, though, most of the buildings in Southern California are built to fairly high earthquake codes, so you're not so much concerned about the building collapsing. However, if you were in something like an unreinforced uh, masonry building, so a brick building, then yeah, I might try and get out. <laughs> yeah. People are laughing at me because I am right now uh, in a house that has been Condemned is an overstatement, but the, <laughs> the building, Department of Building and Safety is demanding that I put shear walling in my yeah. house, which yes. was built in 1924 and doesn't have it. And uh, so I am like building <laughs> codes getting better. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, I have one last question on yes. this, and, uh, and that is, when can I get it? When can we mortals? get on this system. I want it, I want it, I want it. <laughs> I know. So uh, that's actually a very difficult question to answer because we don't currently actually have the funding to fully build out this system. Kickstarter. Uh, <laughs> yeah, seriously. Shakestarter. Shakestarter. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> yeah, so we're working on um, various ways of getting funding for the project. Um, and we project that if the funding showed up tomorrow, we would, it would be two years before public alerts would be going out. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was, I, was, I was censoring myself. I really was. Uh, so, okay. <laughs> what do we do? How can we help? I, I didn't realize this was going to turn into write your con. Yeah, no. I mean, what, what's going to have to happen? Are, are a bunch of people going to have to die first or what? <laughs> I, I, I mean, quite honestly, that, sometimes, that is how... We have gotten money in the past for station build up. The entire. <laughs> sounds awful. Um, the network was essentially built out following large earthquakes in Southern California. So the, the majority of the stations we have, I mentioned upgrading stations, for example. The reason we have to upgrade is because those stations were put in 20 or 30 years ago following large earthquakes that happened in the, in the 80s. Well, it would be great if it happened without any mm -hmm. catastrophic things, so yes. I guess I'm not too sorry I censored myself. Go ahead. Do you guys have, like, legal counsel after what's been going on in Italy? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> can, yes. can you so, tell us what he's referring to? Yeah, so there was a, um, an, indi oh, right. an yeah. indictment Lachila of... Earthquake. <laughs> yeah, L'Aquila. Um, earthquake occur an earthquake occurred in Italy um, and it was preceded by a number of foreshocks at the time so these are smaller events that happened before a large earthquake but we don't we can't recognize something as a foreshock until the big one the bigger one happens and so a number of Italian seismologists were indicted for having not predicted the main shock and yes and it was recently <coughs> overturned yeah last like week, last week they were acquitted yeah oh, they were thank acquitted. Goodness. but yeah, they I remember we talked about it here because it's yes <laughs> yeah, that's not yes. good um yeah so hopefully not <laughs> cuz i'd rather get a false alarm and yeah. live with it right. and and uh mm -hmm. then you know and if it's just even just cuz i hate the feeling of having it happen and and the the adrenaline rush right. i'd rather uh, no and then Okay, I can brace myself or yeah, get under the table. We or do talk about it more in terms, you know, a lot of times in terms of psychological impact. Yeah. The fact that you know that the earthquakes, that it is an earthquake, and you don't have to spend the first couple of seconds going, what, what's going on? Yeah, and and oh, dollar sign, percent sign, and, you know, because there's that moment where you're like, right. ah. so yeah. Yes, last question. Uh, it would seem as though it would be just a matter of software, but obviously if it's a two-year lead time, it's not. No, it's not just a matter of software. It's a matter of also building out stations. And these stations take to make sure we have all of the faults covered and make sure we can quickly detect those earthquakes. And these stations are not a minor undertaking. Permitting alone takes a year. One of those things, you're already getting the alerts yourself. So isn't it just a matter of software to give those to everybody? So the issue with the alerts we're getting right now is that um, the performance varies quite significantly depending on where the earthquake happens. So if it happens in a place where there's very low station density, we had a, there was an earthquake in northeastern California, and the system just really did not get a good estimate for that and kind of mislocated it and had multiple sort of additional false alerts based on that event. And so it's a matter of getting the stations in, getting te telemetry from those stations back to the central server, building up these servers, making them robust and replicated. And so there's a lot of, a lot of pieces. <laughs> so get back to work when yeah. you're not here. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Oh, really, the sooner the better. I think we can all agree. Um, so uh, so um, let's thank Elizabeth for coming and talk all about.